Hi, I'm Jude from HeadFi.org, and on this episode of HeadFi TV, we have a special guest, Jacob Sondergaard from Head Acoustics, and we're going to talk about uh, a topic that I find very fascinating, and I think you'll understand why uh, very shortly, and that's active noise canceling. And we want to talk about why some active noise canceling headphones are more effective than others, but there's some surprising information in all of that, but I guess I'll let you introduce yourself first. Right. Well, first of all, it's good to be here. Thanks for having me, Jude. My name good is Jacob you. Sondergaard. I'm an account manager with Head Acoustics. And Head Acoustics is a company that really focuses on all things voice and audio. So part of uh, the scope of my work is also to look at how do we gauge the performance of ANC headphones. Yeah, so for me, this is a really fascinating topic because it goes back to... Um, 2015, 16, I don't remember when uh, Sony released these. This is the MDR-1000X. Um, and um, at the time, Bose had recently released the uh, QC35. And for many, many years, we'd assumed, it's almost like a law in audio, um, Bose is first place in terms of canceling noise, actively canceling noise. They're always first place. Everybody else was racing for second. And then right. Sony sent me the MDR-1000X, and it just happened to be right before I was leaving for a trip to Tokyo. Um, so I had a nice long flight to test this and this with the 1000X and the QC35. Um, again, fully expected this to come in second, just wanted to know how close it was gonna get. But to make a long story short, to my ears, there was no question the MDR1000X canceled more noise than the QC35. I let a couple of my neighbors listen to it. I've done this many times, actually. And, and, and most of them, if not all of them, agreed that it canceled more noise than the Bose. And so for me, this was such an exciting development. I got so pumped about this that I did something that I'd never done before and I haven't done since, and that was a selfie video. So I got to Shibuya, to Tokyo, and I was walking around the streets of Shibuya because it was also, um, to me, seemed more effective at canceling noise even in a city environment. And uh, so I shot a selfie video just talking about how somebody finally beat Bose. To my ears, somebody finally beat Bose, and it was Sony with the MDR-1000X. And we released that video, um, and yeah, again, haven't done a selfie video since. Fast forward to, I think it was January 2018 at, at Alma, um, you did a presentation on, on, on active noise canceling, essentially assessment, yep. measurement. Um, and it was so fascinating to me because what it told me was that you might actually be able to cancel. Well, okay, I guess I should go back and say that I saw a measurement. Somebody had measured these two in terms of total noise canceled. And I was surprised to find that Bose canceled a couple dB more noise. And, uh, in, you know, on, uh, on an analyzer, measured on an analyzer. But your talk in January 2018 because um, I was confused by this. But your talk in January 2018, I felt kind of clarified it for me um, because it kind of explained how what I experienced, why that might happen. Anyways, I, at this point, I want to turn it over to you so you can talk about this paper because right sure. after you were done, I was so excited that I literally, I think I was the first one to get up after the Q&A was over, go right to you and say, Jacob, man, we got to talk about this on HeadFi sometime. And it took us this long. We got to talk about so, it. So let's yeah, talk about it. Yeah, I know. So, we finally that? got what? together, but... You're right. The uh, video that you made there on the streets of Tokyo, I mean, that was a little bit of a watershed moment, right? You said for the first time, it's no longer a race for second place. Somebody actually came out and, and did a fantastic job, pretty much on par with maybe even better than the existing owners of the ANC domain. And, you know, we took notice of that, of course. And uh, throughout the course of 2017, you know, we gathered some headphones, we looked at them, we measured them, and, you know, we were seeing what most people saw. Some headphones measure better than others. But we were trying to look for explanations for why some headphones are still perceived as offering better active noise cancellation, even if the FFT response or the overall dB attenuation provided doesn't really say the same. And so we drew on a lot of our experiences from voice and telecommunications and sound quality analysis, and we, we took the path of psychoacoustics. The, I think the thing that led us down that path is if you are designing a product and you are using the FFT analyzer and the FFT response to guide your design work, 
The risk is that you end up designing a product that satisfies the desires of an FFT analyzer. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I think what what we wanted to do was we wanted to figure out a way that we could design products that end up satisfying the human hearing system and not an FFT analyzer. And that's where things like psychoacoustics come into play. Psychoacoustics at its core is really taking a physical stimuli, like noise, sound, audio, and you connect that to the subjective response, not quite the emotion, but the subjective perception or the evaluation of that's what psychoacoustics is. And that's where head acoustics has a fantastically strong background in psychoacoustics. So we looked at this ANC problem, we said, let's draw on the expertise and the technologies available to us from these other adjacent disciplines to audio and ANC, but more on the voice and telecommunication side. Let's apply them and see what we get. So we proposed these four different, uh, let's call them principles that we wanted to apply to ANC measurements. One of them is let's get beyond just using ANC, uh, pink noise for evaluating ANC. Because pink noise is very deterministic, it's steady state, there's no transients, it's just you know pink noise being displayed. That's not representative of the real world. That's not necessarily an airplane, that's not the streets of Tokyo, that's not a cafe or a pub or a train or wherever you're sitting and wanting ANC applied. So number one is let's get some realistic noises. Let's present them to the device where we include the spatial information. So let's recreate those environments for the headphones and see how they perform. Now number two is the first rule of psychoacoustics is the human brain is not an FFT analyzer, right? I think if we go back to the days of Fletcher Munson and we look at the old uh, hearing loudness contour curves, it's pretty clear that the human hearing is not a linear system. It's not a linear process, right? Very low frequencies, we're not very sensitive. One to 4K, super sensitive. I mean, right there, you know, smoke detectors, when they're going off, oh, that's piercing right in those areas because that's where we're most sensitive. So when you're sleeping, this thing goes off, bang, right in there, somewhere between one and 4K. Once we go higher in frequency, eh, we're not as sensitive. So already there, we know that there are things that make the human brain unlike an FFT analyzer. Additionally, humans are very sensitive to changes in level versus time. So we're more like a time waveform analyzer as opposed to an FFT analyzer. So there are multiple reasons why we're saying, let's look at psychoacoustics, let's see if there's something that we can gather from these metrics that the FFT analyzer can't tell us. So. We took a couple of headphones, we measured them, the FFT response showed, sure enough, there's a couple of dB difference. Headphone one, a little bit better ANC performance than headphone two. I think it was something like two dB difference between the two headphones that we chose. And you're not gonna tell us now, the models, I'm taking it. Not today. Okay, so, all right. the so headphone, we're gonna talk about so, headphone one and headphone two. That's what we'll okay. stick with today. And okay. I'll set the stage by saying that there's a two dB difference in the overall attenuation and then okay. to, Draw an analogy. This is our, the founder of our company, uh, Professor Klaus Genowit. I remember he told me this over dinner, um, not that long ago, actually, last time he was in Detroit. And um, he said that sound quality or judging the quality of sound versus judging it by an overall number like a dB attenuation, FFT, something like that when we're talking about ANC, is a little bit akin to you being at a restaurant and the waiter serving you a bowl of soup and you tasting and say, you know what, I don't like the soup and the waiter saying it's the right temperature, right? That is almost zero bearing <laughs> on the overall quality. And that's where I'm standing a little bit with the FFT um, response or analysis of an ANC system and the overall dB attenuation. It's not that it's not important, it matters, you want to get the temperature right, but it's not everything. It doesn't explain everything about the nuance and the detail of how that system is perceived subjectively. So we take the ball, we run with it, we apply some of these metrics and we wanted to take things that other people would be able to apply as well. So we drew from the standards community and we said, look, ANSI S3.5, Speech Intelligibility Index. There's a great metric that looks at the things like the weighting functions that are similar to the loudness contour curves. It looks at masking effects where, you know, if you play two tones on a, uh, on a 
a loudspeaker and you measure it with a microphone or even just through headphones and you measure it on the mannequin, well, the FFT analyzer will clearly see two tones, but a human ear will have masking effects where it's not as clear cut, it's just showing two tones. I mean, already there, there are examples of, okay, the human ear is not an FFT analyzer. The human hearing system performs differently. So in any case, we looked at speech intelligibility index because it's been around for a long time, it's standardized, it sort of serves the purpose here. And oddly enough, despite the name speech intelligibility index, the SII metric itself is actually a means of quantifying the quality of the speech environment. So we're actually looking at the noise, characterizing the noise and saying, how would that affect potential speech communication in that environment? So when we look at something like an ANC headphone, great. We have the residual noise measurements taken at the eardrums of headphone one and headphone two with ANC on, ANC off. We have all the different noise scenarios. We also have without headphones as a baseline. And we can say now using the speech intelligibility index, that noise left at the eardrum, how easy would it be to have a conversation in that noise? Now to translate that back to a real world scenario, ANC use case, a very typical one is you just want to block out the outside world and listen to a podcast or music or something like that, right? But how good is that ANC of removing the outside noise and then leaving you with just the speech or audio or music content that you want to enjoy? And so the speech intelligibility index, when we applied it to headphone one and headphone two, we saw that there was a, an inverse ranking order now where headphone one, which performed better when measured with the FFT analyzer, all of a sudden had a lower speech intelligibility index. So give me one second, I just wanted two. to interrupt real quick. To, to, when we're talking about measured better, we're talking strictly about active noise canceling, canceling noise. That's all we're referring to that is, for that this is discussion. That is correct. Okay. And, correct, uh, okay. we're not talking frequency response or THD plus N or anything like okay. that regarding the audio quality. We're talking about how well does the ANC algorithm work in reducing the outside noise. Basically. So total noise canceled on an FFT basis, headphone one had the advantage over headphone two. Yes. Now looking at SII, speech, intellig <laughs> speech intelligibility index, um, Right. which one, I'm sorry, which one had the advantage there? Headphone two. Okay, so headphone so two. So now take. headphone two performs better, gives us several percentage points higher SII than headphone one, meaning it's a lot easier to have a conversation in the residual noise left behind by headphone two versus headphone one. So it's completely inverse and completely opposite of the trend that we saw with the FFT analyzer. And remember, this is taken across multiple different background noises, right? This is not just pink noise. We have driving noise. We have a pub environment and a cafeteria. We have you standing at an intersection where you have traffic on both directions. And the beautiful thing about this system, the background noise reproduction system, is that the reproduced material includes the spatial characteristics of the original sound. So it's as if you are standing in that pub or standing on that street corner or standing uh, inside of a cafe or whatever other noise scenario we chose because the spatial information is contained in the reproduction. So for those a little bit more sophisticated active noise cancellations, they don't rely on just a single mic. Maybe there's some beam forming taking place, multiple mic locations they all can take advantage of the spatial information here at the background. Noise. So, so it's as if stuff. we are, right. So it's as if we are in the real world when we're doing this. And the Can I interrupt one SII more time? Metric, because I, I, I want to make this clear about how well, and this is very important to what you guys are doing, is recreating these environments that you're using as test environments. I want to, we're probably right here. I'm going to see if we can't edit a picture in to the video to show kind of what the setup looks like with the speakers. Because sure. I've sat in the sweet spot of that setup where otherwise a mannequin would be, right, to measure a, a headphone. It's a small right. sweet spot, but the mannequin doesn't move. But when you're in that sweet spot and you close your eyes, you are in a pub. You are in a moving car. The sound, it's, and like you said, it's not just the the accuracy of of the you know the performance of it you know in the frequency domain like just here it's also that 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 timing um, because right. it's around you it's all around you you're immersed in it and that's how you're testing 
the ANC headphones, a mannequin in the sweet spot in that, you know, and so the, again, the environment all the time and uh, uh, frequency domain characteristics are, are accurate at that point. It's experiencing the environment as if in the environment, which is That's important because it's think... super convincing as a human to, to be there, which I've done a few times with you in that setup. Right. Yeah. Okay. Right. So anyways. And even though, you know, the system isn't designed for our own subjective enjoyment and just listening right. to different environments, it's, we can get a good kick out of making our own recordings and, and kind of tricking people into thinking they're somewhere else. Yeah. That's pretty cool. But you're right. It is designed for stressing the ANC system of, of headphones or, and uh, reproducing background noise environments. It's not just headphones. I mean, mobile phones and, and other communication devices have noise suppression and things like that that we test with this system as well okay. but specifically now yes it cre it recreates the original background noise environment and with the speech intelligibility index we had that first indication that ah maybe psychoacoustics can tell us a little bit about what's going on with these headphones because when we listen to them yeah we get a sense that maybe headphone 2 isn't as bad maybe there isn't that 2 db difference right and psychoacoustics is starting to tell us there's something to that it's a lot more than just the overall fft response and so you know encouraged by that we took the we took the baton we ran on we got to the next metric that we wanted to use which was squeaker loudness we wanted to see here's a different metric uh loudness is I guess a good way to put it is um, it's a convenient way to order the complex sounds of various levels, various spectra on a scale of subjective magnitude. Okay, so it's, it's again, it's about using the human hearing system, replicating that and, and scaling it according to how a human would perceive it. So um, if you've heard of the, the, the term, uh, the fawn curves, 40 yeah. fawn, 50 fawn curves, right? They're, they're basically similar to the loudness contours from dating back to Fletcher Munson in the 30s. And if we have a number like 40 fawn, that means that the sound is equivalent to a 40 dB SPL tone at one kilohertz. And then because logarithmic scales can be a little tricky to, to work with in our brains, there is a parallel metric or a parallel unit called zones, where one zone of loudness is equivalent to 40 fawn, which of course is 40 dB SPL at 1K. Now, zones is a linear scale. So two zones is twice as loud as one zone and, and four zones is twice as loud as two zones. So when we measure headphone one and headphone two, and we analyze what is the residual noise. We just crank these things to max ANC, expose them to our eight different noise scenarios, and we measure the residual noise left at the eardrum. How does Zwicker loudness in particular evaluate the loudness on this subjective magnitude scale in terms of zones? And what we saw was they were fairly close with headphone two actually had lower loudness. So it's perceived to be quieter at the ears in the passive situation. And then when ANC kicked in, bang, the gap widened. Obviously both the ANC helped, but the gap actually widened, telling us that the ANC on headphone two is actually doing something that's more sophisticated than the ANC on headphone one. Even though the FFT analyzer told us, hey, headphone one is better, it gets us 2 dB more of attenuation. There's something about headphone 2 that's doing something that not only SII is telling us, oh, it's easier to communicate, but Swicker Loudness is telling us it's quieter. Perceptually, it is quieter. And so it is distinctly possible that there's a different way to go about tuning ANC systems than just attributing everything to the FFT analyzer response. Fascinating. Super fascinating. Does that fascinating. make sense? Yes. So might a headphone, for example, uh, gain an advantage because you were talking about uh, the fawn curves or now the zone. Um, right. And might it gain an advantage, for example, where it doesn't count? I'm just using an example. I don't know specifically about these two headphones, but let's just say, for example, I know this one cancels a little bit more noise uh, than this one, uh, uh, which surprised me to find out. Um, but might it be possible that this one, just as an example, not necessarily the Bose QC35, but say, okay, let's just talk headphone one and two. Um, is it possible that headphone two or one was maybe gaining its FFT advantage at a frequency that, that was less meaningful to cancel to a human, like low frequencies, you know? Correct. Um, 
Okay. Correct. I think I think that's exactly you know one of the lessons that we're learning here is that um, because an FFT analyzer has a very linear response and a human hearing system system is very nonlinear, there are certain frequencies that matter a lot more. And you know, as a off the wall example, if you're focusing all your energy and the MIPS, the processing that takes place in the ANC circuitry on canceling the noise down at 20 hertz. Well, 20 hertz, that's really just below the threshold, the, the lower limits of human hearing. At that point, it's almost vibration. Does it really matter? No, it, it probably doesn't. I mean, that's a very obvious example, but you know, ANC systems typically kick in around 1K-ish and affect everything below 1K. So there's definitely things that are taking place there up to between 1K and down to about 20 hertz where there, it matters how you implement it. It matters what you focus on. All right, so and just that's keeping what quick these score. psychoacoustic metrics are showing us. All right, so just keeping a quick score, total FFT basis, headphone one beats headphone two by a couple dB. Um, looking yep. at SII, headphone two has a slight advantage, has an advantage. Uh, Zwicker Correct. loudness, Zwicker loudness, um, headphone two has a slight advantage in passive mode and takes an even bigger advantage in active mode. All right, very cool. Correct. All right, Correct. and what other metrics did you guys look at? So I think the last thing I want to mention is that we use the metric called 3Quest. And 3Quest is a MOS metric, MOS meaning mean opinion scores, but it's a MOS metric that we are taking from the telecommunications world. It's used to evaluate the speech quality in the presence of background noise. And we said that's fairly adjacent to the application of measuring the reproduced speech at the eardrums from a pair of ANC headphones in the presence of noise. And for those that are unfamiliar with a mean opinion score, a MOS metric, the idea is really that you take 300 people in a room, you ask them to evaluate some form of sound or product, and you ask them to rate that experience from one to five, one being the worst and five being the best. And as is the case with human nature, you'll get you know, 300 people right in the middle somewhere say, yeah, that's, that's good, it's average, whatever. And then there is a small subset they'll say, ah, I've heard much better. This is only a two out of five instead of a three out of five. And a few people will say, well, you know what? This is pretty good. I'm gonna rate it a four instead of a three. So there's a little bit of that human nature, but the MOS metric takes all that into account. And then we design it to judge other similar sounds, other sounds like it, as if we were presenting it to these 300 jury members, like as part of a jury study. Now, underneath the hood of the 3Quest algorithm, I think that's the key thing. We use something called the Relative Approach Hearing Model. It's much newer than anything that uh, Zwicker did back in the 70s, or even more Glassberg here in the 2000s. Um, relative Approach is a lot newer. And the key thing with Relative Approach is it considers both the uh, spectral and the temporal effects on the human hearing system. And to, you know, we talked about the loudness contour curves, how the, hear the human ear is not as sensitive in certain areas as other areas. We talked about maybe masking effects, two tones being played adjacent to each other. There's some masking taking place. We don't hear one tone as easily versus the other. Now on the temporal side, the fact is humans are much more sensitive to changes in level versus time. So this whole thing about the human brain being more akin to a time waveform analyzer than an FFT analyzer. And the best example I have is if you walk into a room, it's empty, except as soon as you walk in, the, ANC, uh, the um, AC system starts cranking, right? This thing just gears up and starts running, and immediately you hear it. It's like, oh man, that's loud. That's really loud. But as you stand in that room, it's like, oh yeah, okay, it's there. I hear the ANC running. You slowly start to adjust and accommodate to that noise. And the next thing that happens is bang, the, the AC system switches off. And it's almost a startling event. Like you've, you've been to a place where all of, like the music stops, right? Musical chairs, music stop, ooh. That's the, that's the similar thing here where our hearing system is so tuned to be responsive to changes in level, not necessarily the absolute level, because we can adapt to that, but it's the change that we're very sensitive towards. And that's what the relative approach really does a great job of modeling. And that's what's underneath the hood of the three quest MOS metric. So in any case, we took the MOS metric and we said, 
Well, one of the principles of ANC is you should not, for goodness sake, whatever you do, don't ruin the reproduced audio quality. So we applied it, we played some, we connected the headphones to a Bluetooth reference codec. So a reference client that's completely transparent. We sent audio to the headphones, measured it at the eardrums with noise, of course. And we had ANC on, ANC off, and we measured, is there any difference in the reproduced speech quality? In both cases, yeah, the ANC improved the speech quality reproduction, probably because all the noise is being removed as best as they can. But the ANC really has no difference. They both bump up by the same amount. In this case, headphone one is actually a little bit better, coincidentally. Now, when we looked at the noise suppression, or in this case, applied it to evaluate the active noise cancellation, what we saw was that headphone two, again, had better noise cancellation properties. So the MOS metric was higher. More people in our fictitious jury study would have liked the noise suppression on headphone two versus headphone one. And so it's not just speech intelligibility index. It's not just weaker loudness. And it's not just, you know, three quests. It's all of them. All the ones that have roots in hearing models and psychoacoustics that try to gauge things in a subjective magnitude, they all tell us headphone two has better ANC performance than headphone one, even though our FFT analyzer said, oh, headphone one's the winner by about two dB. And so we stood there thinking, man, it's, it really shows that you just cannot put all your eggs into that one basket of an FFT analyzer. And you just, you, you have to be careful with those design choices that you make. You don't want to go down the path of designing a product that satisfies the desires of an FFT analyzer. You want to do, you want to focus on designing a product that satisfies the human ear. And with ANC systems, I think that's, it's, it's, there's been a lot of evolution there. There's been a lot of focus there the last couple of years and systems have gotten a lot better. But what our research showed was there's definitely some tools that we can apply to make sure that we're getting the right changes and the right implementations in the ANC chipset or algorithms or even the physical design of the headphone cup itself that make a meaningful difference to the end user and the, and the consumer. That's fascinating. So that's why I was so excited when you gave the presentation at the Alma conference back in 2018. Um, I think I was the first one to stand up after Q&A was over, ran up to you. Jacob and I go way back. I don't think I've mentioned this. Uh, um, you used to be with Gross. We got our first measurement fixture from you. Um, yep. Back in, I think I met you back in uh, late 2014. You've been to HeadFi HQ many times, more than I can count. Um, you've been one of my measurement mentors early on, especially when we were first starting to do measurements. You and Dan Foley from Audio Precision um, right. have been a couple of, uh, several of my measurement mentors. So um, we go way back. Anyways, I stood up, I was so excited, ran up to you, it was like, we got to talk about this on HeadFi at some point, and now we finally have. But I'm hoping that you can also um, make yourself available on the forums for anybody that might have questions about this, because this is pretty fascinating stuff. I mean, I find it crazy fascinating. So you're not mentioning any specific models, but for me, um, I found out, again, that the QC35 counts at a little bit more noise on a, uh, you know, uh, just uh, total noise uh, than um, the uh, MDR1000X. But uh, to my ears, and the ears of just about everybody I've let hear the two, on an airplane especially, um, feels that the 1000X is more effective. So I was very surprised by finding out that it actually canceled a couple dB less than the Bose QC35. I guess what I'm trying to say here is, uh, whereas I was a bit, you know, surprised by that, maybe your study helps explain how that might be possible. Um, or how I, that might... I believe so. Yeah. So that's super so. duper and fascinating. I, I think I'd like to say that, you know, I'm happy to jump into the forum. I know this is a little bit adjacent to what you, you're typically doing on Head5 with you, and I think the typical focus um, of your membership yeah, on sure. Head5. But I'm happy to jump in because, you know, even as a personal consumer, I travel a lot. I think most people have experienced jumping onto an airplane or public transportation. It's just noisy and want to get rid of the ANC. And I think if nothing else, it's just a lesson to maybe just be a little bit wary of the fact that an FFT response and an overall dB attenuation doesn't tell you everything about how that ANC actually ends up being perceived. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, 
hopefully there's some interest. I'm happy to jump in and, and answer questions and elaborate on some. I mean, we could talk about this for hours. Yes, we could. So now, now, now the thing about <laughs> it is, uh, you, uh, we're, you know, we're in Metro Detroit here at Head Fi HQ, yep. and some people might say, well, you know, not, might think there's not a whole lot around here to do with audio, but there surprisingly is. Head Acoustics U.S. headquarters is about 30 minutes away. Um, from our office. Right. Bruin Care has their Global Engineering Services building that's like 10 minutes away. There's the Rausch NVH building, which is very close by as well. And they let us, they've let us use the facilities before with their anechoic chambers. Um, so there's some really cool stuff around here. Because Head Acoustics US headquarters is just 20, 30 minutes away, we've talked about doing tests. I know yep. we're now in uh, you know, kind of a stay home, work from home mode right at the moment. But the moment we can uh, get back to you know, more work as usual, I'm hoping that's something that we can still do because we've talked about testing more ANC headphones. We're still going to do that? I would love to. I mean, you're right. You, well, you know, you're right there in Motor City. There's a lot of people Motor that are City. focused on audio, right, in, yes, uh, sir. in the Detroit area. But Har uh, Yeah, Harman has an office too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. So, so I'd love to get together. We put up the system again. And, you know, even one of the things I'd love to do is at a future Can Jam try and get the system up and just for those people that attend can jam just experience the background noise reproduction it's, it's phenomenal quite a sight. it's quite it's, 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 it's quite super duper interesting i know it wasn't built to like you said built to entertain no. but it is but it is extremely entertaining because it really transports right. you especially if you close your eyes and you're in that sweet spot it really transports right. you to the environments that you that you're reproducing and not right. just and it's not just like oh yeah it sounds like it it feels like it because you yep. you're getting the 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 spatial information uh, really tight in that sweet spot. It's pretty fantastic stuff. Um, so I think we have a lot to talk about. I'm hoping that we can talk about this more on HeadFi. I know you guys have done some other interesting tests. Oh, and I do want to test other headphones. I'd like to test, of course. say, I, I think Bose may, I don't know, we'll see what your results show. To my ears, Bose may have taken the lead again with their new NC700, so we'll get to that. Um, uh, which brings me to another thing that maybe we can discuss, not today, which is I know at AES San Francisco, Head Acoustics presented on transparency. Uh, that is the, uh, the pass-through function, which I think is another important feature, not just for living, if you're going to be using something like an ANC headphone, but also for augmented reality. We don't have time to get into that now because that's all like a whole other discussion. But you guys are doing some fascinating work in that respect as well. So anyway, Jacob. Um, oh, so let's do the final tally. Um, headphone one, better in, on a pure FFT basis, just to tie this up. Better pure FFT, better overall response, right? Okay. Headphone two, better speech intelligibility index, better swicker loudness scores, and better noise suppression or noise cancellation scores on the MOS metric. Phenomenal. Headphone one, slightly better speech quality reproduction, but the ANC had the similar effect on both of them. So point is, there's a lot more to ANC then you really notice at the surface. Absolutely brilliant. All right, man. So looking forward to getting together again. It's been a few months since I've seen you uh, in person. Yeah. So uh, we're long overdue to uh, have a sushi dinner or something and do some measurements. Sounds good, man. Jacob, Take thanks care. for coming by. Thanks man. a lot.